<laughs> G'day, hi, and welcome. Got myself off guard there. All right. Okay, I got some explaining to do. Check out my hat. Um, the climate change thing. I, I've done videos on it before and stuff like that. I got to explain my position. I, I, th I think it's only fair that I do that. And I know some people, when you, you come out and you say you don't believe in uh, global warming, uh, they take it as a personal attack sometimes, but... Uh, that type of thing. And I find millennials are more been more duped into it or whatever. Now, when I say I don't believe in global warming or whatever, it's kind of like how, you know, Russians hacked everything. You know? I kind of take it like that. Is there been global warming? Yes. There's clear, what I'm saying is I don't believe in anthropogenic man-made global warming. I, you know, it's not due to the CO2 levels. I let, let me explain here. When I first heard the term global warming, oh my God, the the sky has fallen, the earth is going to, we're all going to be living on the surface of Mars by 2013, this is back in the 90s. The Al Gore hockey stick, oh my God, we're all going to die. And back in, back when it came out, the internet wasn't as prevalent, uh, prevalent as it is now for finding information and stuff. Like, you, you, the internet was there, but it was not, not the, the treasure trove of information. Come on up, come on Missy, you're going to interrupt the video anyway, so you must come up. Tell her to come up, she'll come up. If I don't say nothing, she'll just do it. Uh, the thing is, is that, you know, I was, I, like everybody, you're concerned about it. You're like, oh my God, that, that's, uh, that's terrible. That's kill. We kill her. And uh, she, she has to come and, you know, ruin the video. Always. And uh, anyway, uh, yeah, it's like, you, you're, you don't, you're concerned. You're definitely concerned. So you look at it and then you hear, you know, just one thing after that. Oh my God, you know, if you don't do this or you don't do that, comply, comply, comply. And oh, we have to bring in this new law and this new tax and this new everything uh, to, you know, or else the, the world's going to explode, you know. So then, after a while, you start to get a, a difference of opinion. And it's like, okay, well, those people, why are they saying what they're saying? And for me, uh, at first, it was the, the argument, you know, what they were saying, well, no, that's just the oil company scientists, uh, you know, doing what they do. So that became a good scapegoat for a while, and people still believed on it, you know. But then what you had was 749, I think, scientists, 48, 49 uh, scientists out of, I think, 1,100 polled globally. And out of that, the, the high majority of them was uh, something like 748, 749 said yes. Global warming, there's global warming, and there's a problem, and stuff like that. Uh, now, again, you have to think of one little detail here. Yes, of course we've been warming since the last ice age. You know, so that, that's a given. But the thing is, is rapid global warming, that we were going to hit like 2 degrees centigrade, and it would be complete biomass failure, and stuff like that. Um, and, and that big scare. Uh, you know, the... the the thing is, is that you have these scientists that said that. Then there was like, you know, a few thousand scientists saying, no, this is not man-made. This is, uh, CO2 doesn't drive climate. Climate drives CO2. It's the other way around. And the feedback loop that they were using, Lord Monkston, uh, he's, he's, he's kind of dry to listen to, but uh, he's done a lot of research on this. And it was, oh, he's in bed with the oil companies, whatever. Uh, not so much so. Now, then after a while, it started to get, and I, and I wasn't really looking at the, like, it wasn't my number one issue. It was never my number one issue. Then it got to 11,000 11, scientists were saying, no, <laughs> this is, this is fo phony and false. This is a fake narrative. Now it's over 20,000 scientists out there. Trust me, they don't all work for the oil company. Is there doctoring on both sides? Yes, there is oil company scientists out there that um, are saying no. Uh, but there's other scientists that are nonpartisan that are saying no. And again, that number of scientists, you know, they're not accepting the theory that like it, it, it doesn't hold it doesn't hold water. So what was supposed to happen? The greenhouse effect. I've seen the scientific experiments, and it's like, okay, well, the, the theory works. It, it does work. It, you know, you put. It, but the thing is, is their theories aren't happening. You know, where they say the CO2 is supposed to build up in, in the atmosphere, it's not. It's not going that high. And the other thing, too, is it's, no, it's not even one thousandth of the lethal dose of uh, the CO2. And, you know, it goes on and on and on and on and on. 
And then, uh, you know, uh, Colbert Report did a, a, a really good, good thing on it. This is a huge subject anyway. Uh, but, you know, the short of it is, is that the, the CO2 isn't building up to the levels. And in fact, in a lot of areas, trees are just starving for extra CO2. We actually could use more of it. Now, what I say is I separate pollution from climate change because one doesn't necessarily drive the other. Uh, I'm not saying humans have no impact on the environment whatsoever. I'm saying man is no match for Mother Nature is what I'm saying. And the thing is, is the other thing you have to look at is where the sensors are. The majority of them are all in the states, which the states, most of the states is pretty warm to begin with. I mean, it's more southern than up here in Canada. If, every, if the amount of uh, thermometers in the states were up here in Canada, you would see, the, you would see cooler temperatures because we have longer winters and stuff like that. Uh, and in the pole regions, there's something like, I think, eight sensors in the uh, uh, Antarctic and 16 in the North Pole or something, or the other way around. It's been a while since I looked at it. And there's like 7,000 pretty much like, throughout the states. And they're all near the big cities and stuff like that. So where they set the thermometers, and they're not equally distributed around the world. And you know, that there's a, I can't remember, 16, 1700 throughout Europe and stuff like that. So it's not a, a perfect representation of temperature and the other problem too is the times of day they take the temperature and there's there there lies a problem it's not a 24 hour temperature reading uh, you know for an average temperature it's done during the day it's warmer during the day any place on the planet is usually warmer during the day uh, except for maybe in the arctic poles where you have six six months a day six months of of, of night so these things have to be taken con into consideration and, of course, NOAA, which is, at the end of the day, owned by the Rothschilds, they keep getting caught manipulating the data to show more warming than there is. And how much warming are we talking about? Well, 0.85 of a degree. Like, it's, it's not even one degree that the, 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 the temperature is up. And nobody ever talks about the benefits of an actual longer growing season and stuff like that from warmer climates. And th it goes on and on and on and on and on. And you even have... The guy who came up with Al Gore with the hockey stick curve uh, for global warming, is he, uh, this guy, the UN guy, uh, I can't remember his name, but he's like the scientist that pretty much kicked this all off. Even he's come out and said there's been no significant global warming in 19 to 20 years. It, it's, you know, it, it's like this. It's not, it's not the hockey stick curve. Now, were there times where uh, the... You know, again, they, the way they did the CO2 charts, again, Steve Colbert did a better report on it. They manipulated to make it look like the CO2 was driving the climate change, and it, it clearly wasn't. Because their climate models, don't look at the models, look at what actually happened. So you look at the models, and, oh my God, look at that, look at that. Uh, and the, the problem you get is that that's not what actually happened. You know, um, Last year, for example, we had an El, uh, El Nino. And it was one of the, they call it the Godzilla El Nino because it was warmer than normal. But that had to do a lot with under what was happening under the ocean with the, uh, basically, lava flows under the ocean. It was warming it up more than normal. And, it, you know, it, virtually half of Canada didn't have a winter. Uh, it was mild. Like right now, it's, it's mild and, and more mild than usual. But the winter started a lot earlier this year. And it, I think it's going to go on a lot longer. So I'm glad that it's a little more mild, but I mean, the amount of snow we've been getting too, is, I haven't seen, it's not like when I was a kid kind of snow, but it's getting there. I mean, we're midway through January and I think February is just going to be a complete disaster and March is going to be like so much snow, we're not going to know what to do. And you're seeing the snow belt move more south. The other thing, uh, you're seeing snow in areas that, you know, haven't gotten snow in 30 years. You're seeing snow in Saudi Arabia and Syria, uh, you know, multiple days, not usually it's like a one day deal. Uh, Egypt will get snow like once every five years or ten years or whatever. You can, you know, research it. New Zealand's getting snow that they didn't normally get. Uh, Australia's getting snow that they didn't normally get. And it goes on and on and on. And I mean, it's not that these places don't get snow. It's just, it's very rare. So everywhere around the world, you know, snowfalls are kind of up everywhere. Record colds are showing up all over Europe, even during the summer. Uh, so, yes, regional climate doesn't dictate global climate, but you can look around and see that, okay, we're seeing more cooling trends pop up than warming trends. Now, the other thing is, up in the Arctic and in Antarctica, there's two anomalies going on right now. There's a warm spot in the North Pole, under the ocean, uh, and 
that has more to do with the, you know, again, probably underground volcanoes, uh, that type of thing. And in Antarctica, they've got a real mystery where half the continent is, you know, more snow than they've ever seen, and the other half kind of melts, and they, they can't quite figure it out, and where they can't quite figure out where all the fresh water is going. But they have recently discovered a warm spot. That warm spot is probably a volcano way underneath. And that, that's what it, it most likely is. So obviously where it's, the volcano is, it's probably going to, <laughs> going to melt. You see this in Iceland, you know, where the, the geysers come up. There's never any snow there. Why? Because, you know, you've got the hot springs there. You know, so it, you can swim in it all year round, uh, that type of thing. And people are starting, to, you know, you start factoring, factoring those things in, then you realize how, you know, it's impossible uh, to really get 100% uh, data on it. Now, there's another thing going on, and I'm doing a complete separate video on this, I just haven't gotten around to it, is the pole shifts. The jet streams are moving around. Uh, they're going higher instead of coming down. They're going higher. Uh, this, is, this is a weird thing. They're changing. But are they changing because of climate change, uh, you know, anthropogenic man-made global warming, or are they changing because of other reasons? Well, the pole shift, you know, a lot of people don't realize that the poles, number one, they're always moving. They've always been moving. You know, this Earth has had several pole shifts in its history. And pole shifts usually usher in violent weather. Now, take that into consideration. The majority of CO2 does not come from man. It doesn't come from us. Uh, we're something like 1% or something like that uh, of the CO2. Uh, you, you hear a lot of different numbers out there. The majority is from forest fires and volcanoes and stuff like that. That's where the majority of your CO2 comes from. Now, volcanic activity is on the rise. It's, it's, it, it, it hit a high peak in 2011 and a second high peak in 2015. 2016 was up, and we'll have to wait and see what 2017 holds. And I'll be doing a thing on the volcanic activity as well. But historically speaking, volcanic activity is usually more active during cooling periods. For some strange reason, I don't know. I don't know all the science behind it. That's what it is. Now, uh, a lot of there's people like DW News, for example, saying the reason why we're seeing so much cooling is because of the global warming. Now, the science he explains in there is sounds very correct. I mean, the theory fits. Problem is, is you could also say is that science or spin? <laughs> you know, it's like it, cooling is cooling, warming is warming. If one is, and you just have to factor in Earth has cycles and you know, there's un, you know, there's things that you know we cannot, um, we can't account for. For example, a changing jet stream. If you got a changing jet stream, you're going to get, wow, you're, the weather you're going to get is going to be bizarre. And typically, the powerful storms are, you know, hot air hits, uh, hits cold air, or vice versa. Well, the power of a storm is always the cold air, and these violent storms that we see, you know, storms of the century type of things. Uh, they're, they're definitely due to colder air coming in. So, again, this cold air is coming from somewhere. And it's more violent that way. So, if the global temperatures are really not up by that much on average, then it wouldn't explain, it, w it wouldn't explain that the hot air is mashing into the cold air and the violence is because it's so much warmer that the cold air that's, you know, it, it would all kind of level out fairly good. But what happens is you've got the warm air that's left. It's being pushed out of the way by the cold air, right? Um, and that cold air is even colder. So it's cooling. It's, and again, there seems to be enough evidence out there that we, we're seeing cooling trends. And the sun also, again, you can almost, if you look at what's happened with the sun, you can go back 5,000 years, you can go back 25,000 years, Follow the, the sun's model, and you almost see, you know, like a lockstep. The sun changes, the earth, it follows step. It follows suit. It's not always, it's not immediate. It, it's, it's different. Now, we have a weird solar storm thing happening with the earth's magnetic field, where its magnetosphere is kind of blowing that, that way. So it's thinner on the side that's facing the sun. Meaning, uh, think of it like in Star Trek terms where the force fields are down. So we're taking on more radiation. We're taking on more uh, from the sun. And that's going to make a big difference. But we're also going in, we're in 2011, we went from a solar maximum. We're going into the solar minimum now. We're just moving into that. And the big dark spot on the sun, somebody commented that. I look at the sun all the time. I didn't see that. Uh, that was a few months ago or maybe about six months ago. 
NASA released a photo with a big dark spot about a third, you know, the, the, the big black spot on the sun. It was just like, they'd never seen that before. And I don't know how long that lasted, but it, 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 it's, it's, yeah. So, but the sun is cooling. And as it's cooling, so are we. Uh, it's following, that seems to, that, that sign seems to hold up pretty good. And the other thing you need to look at is that uh, with the cooling trends and stuff like that, is the Arctic ice is larger than it's ever been. Now, again, arguing that it could be have something to do with the, the volcanic uh, warm spot or whatever. Well, they don't know exactly what the warm spot is, but if it's under the earth, the mo it, it's, it's a lava flow or something, you know, is most likely. And that it will, it, it's melting the, uh, the, the, you know, the, the, the sea, the, the ice and the snow, and that's, that's what's coming out as fresh water sea ice. But it's, uh, right now we're at like 2,000 levels, uh, I think 2,007 levels at the making of the, this video. But in 2014, I think it was like 46% uh, bigger than it. The Antarctic was for, and Arctic poles were like 46% bigger than they've ever been. Uh, they're spreading out. So if that sea ice spreads out, that's going to cool the ocean. You know, the ocean temperatures, the ocean temperatures, they were supposed to get really cool down the deep. Now, the oceans have warmed up some, some bit in, in areas, but not as deep as they said. And it hasn't been having the effect, they said. But that said, if temperatures change, uh, that could have something to do with mass animal die-offs. Uh, I think it might have more to do with the polar shift than it does. I think, I think animals, uh, like their G, the, the polar shift is what's messing them up, I, I think. Uh, because that is common with pole shifts, is mass animal die-offs. Um, the other thing to think about is that with that going on as well, the... What was the other point there? That I, I mean, again, I researched it. You know, I researched it well enough that, and I look at both sides of the argument. I see what the other side's saying, but then it gets countered. And, and most most arguments out there are in favor of, of climate change. Uh, but there, right there lies the proof. Why are they calling it climate change? Well, simple, because there is no significant man-made global warming. The climate is always changing. I think it's more of a cycle of mother nature. And the data that they collect and how they collect the data can really manipulate how it looks. The other thing, too, is if you look at, um, oh, what was the other one? Uh, oh, it was, it was pretty, it was very important on it. Uh, the other, other angles of it was, uh, yeah, like with the Arctic and stuff like that. And, again, the, the, the hot spots there, but on the other side, you got more snow than you would normally get. So again, it's kind of like what we see here in Canada. Last year, again, we had the hottest El Nino pretty much on record, but this year there's no El Nino hardly at all. And we got a lot, you know, again, I started burning wood in uh, September, you know, which is pretty early. We had snow in September. Uh, that's pretty early, you know, for the last past, you know, I haven't seen that since probably about the 80s. Then uh, British Columbia, <laughs> I mean, they got winter for the first time in God knows how long. So it doesn't mean, I mean, it's up and down year to year. Okay, it's up and down year to year. The other one is, uh, yeah, the oceans, and then, of course, uh, you know, like I say, the, the CO2 is not building up where it's supposed to build up. And, of course, there's the, uh, you know, uh, with the uh, volcanic activity, you have that. What other points was there? Uh, there was a few other points to be made here. The uh, record colds everywhere, well, that, that's something else. But the thing is, is if you factor in for, like, El Nino, that, you know, La Nina, El Nino, uh, when we go into a La Nina cycle, I think we're going to see, like, devastating cold winters. <laughs> that's going to be, that's going to be something else. But just the idea that Canada, we now have, a, you know, a completely, like, unlike last year, they didn't, I mean, there, were, there was flowers blooming in, in, in freaking uh, January out in B.C. Not this year. They got a winter this year. And I think that's going to be a trend, a sign of things to come. For, you know, whatever that cycle is going to last. Oh, sea, uh, sea rise. Scientists have concluded that there has been no significant tidal rise in 600 years. So the tidal rise that they're talking about is, is not, it's, there's nothing, it, it grows, it's been going at about the same rate for 600 years. And that tells you, you know, when you hear about, you know, again, the, the feedback loop, I don't think, is the climate model they use. The feedback loop is the media. <laughs> you know, keep hammering you on this climate change thing. 
And again, they can't call it global warming anywhere because it's been so disproven that there, there's no anthropogenic man-made global warming. But that's what their whole thing is based on. That, oh, it's, it's all humans that make the climate change, but it's, it's simply not true. The climate change is, you know, is something that it's what the Earth does. So you factor these things in, then you have to ask yourself the question, why the carbon taxes? You know, and this is something, and again, millennials are probably more likely to be, because they're, more, they're closer to the brainwashing aspect of it out of the schools. And they get one-sided science, and they get climate models. They don't actually get the, well, okay, this is what they said is going to happen, but this is what they predicted back in the 90s. Look from the 90s to now, the climate models are completely, they're, they're, they don't even, they're not even close to each other compared to what actually happened. We're obviously not standing on the surface of Mars right now. And the other thing, too, you have to look at is that the, the carbon tax, okay? Oh, for new technologies, they give you all these buzzwords. This is the United Nations Agenda 2030 is carbon tax. Everything. In Canada, we've got carbon taxes on top of carbon taxes on top, top, top of carbon taxes. Now, what they're actually going to invest it in, I don't know. I think it's just it's a scam like anything. Because how does taxing actually help the environment? It, it doesn't. You know, I mean, if they actually did what they're going to say, they're going to hire a whole bunch of government uh, people to basically do what? You know, they're not going to fix anything. Lowering emissions that w- that helps. That I am for. Like, a, and some people get this idea that if you don't believe in global warming, you just want to rip every resource out of the ground, and um, you know, you don't care about the environment. That, that's absolutely not true. That, that that is absurd. Anybody that knows me, you know, I'm an outdoors guy. You wouldn't call me a tree hugger by. Uh, any any stretch of the imagination. I know you have to break an omelet, uh, break an egg to make an omelet, uh, that type of thing. But I'm also, you know, we don't need pipelines every single place in the country. We don't have to extract every single resource. A balanced approach at it is good. I'm, I'm to me, you know, leave the Arctic alone. But then again, what about all the, the methane in the Arctic? A lot of people are worried about that. You know, they're worried about massive release of releases of methane. I think there's a bit of a scare over scare there too. But I'm like, well, if the methane is coming up naturally, perhaps the Inuit and places like that could really benefit from uh, just, you know, uh, sustainably taking that methane that's naturally coming out of the earth anyway. And methane pockets and stuff like that, yeah, you'll have warm spots where there's methane pockets. You know, it comes up through the sea ice. But this has been happening for billions and billions and billions of years. You know, it goes in cycles. Um, that type of thing. So you have to look at it as, okay, look at both sides of the argument. And anybody that follows my channel, yes, I have my biases, whatever, and stuff like that. And I don't look at one individual year. Look at it over time. And again, you can find times where the CO2 levels were lower and the, the, the Earth was hotter. You can find times where the CO2 levels were higher and the Earth was cooler or warmer. You can find that. And it's it's a... They got it in the you know the carbon dating with the ice. They, they can find out a lot, and a lot of a uh, lot of things. Uh, for example, uh, ice ages and stuff like that. In many ice ages, usually there's some short. Usually the link, the major link, is some sort of massive volcanic activity, like the one that went off in Iceland in two, uh, 1728 or something, some year like that. Two million people died around the world because the effects that had when Mount St. Helen. Um, blew back in 1980. The volcanic ash from that actually created a bit of a, a cooling effect that the Earth's temperature cooled by one degrees and even slowed the rotation of the Earth ever so slightly. Now, mind you, the planet is always slowing down. When the planet was formed, we had a four-day, cy- a four-hour cycle for the 20, you know, now we have 24 hours. The Earth is, it's a spinning ball. I know there's flat earthers out there, but we'll go with accepted science. Uh, spinning ball and it's slowing down as it's oscillating back and forth. So it's a spinning ball oscillating back and forth, and the magnetic pole and the actual poles, they move. I mean, we know the Earth tilts on its axis, which gives you your spring and your summer and your fall and whatever, and your winter, and stuff like that. So with the magnetic pole shift, one of the things with the magnetic pole shift, which is a a total, uh, you know, a total um, subject on its own. Well, you see, the thing you have to keep in mind is that the poles, and again, I haven't found the, the, the very... Hurry up! Let's go! Move it! Oh, there you go. I haven't found uh, 100% conclusive on this, but apparently 
Uh, if you go to Google and you look where the North Pole was and where it is now, in the last past couple of years, it's moved 405 miles from its where it was. The North Pole, the magnetic North Pole, not the actual North Pole. Uh, but magnetic north versus, uh, you know, due north is, is two, two different things. Some people don't know that. Uh, usually when you have a compass, magnetic north and the north pole are like 15 degrees from each other, right? But right now, everything is 405 miles off of where it used to be. It got to the point where the, when the, the poles started shifting quite quickly, and I think that's something at a rate of something like 40 miles per year, uh, you could track it. Uh, I have some charts that I'll be showing up from 1900 up to now, and you can see, you know, it kind of oscillates around, but it, it kind of, you know, it, it's coming down. So right now, the uh, the North Pole is somewhere near. Uh, it, it's getting more towards the Russian side there, in the magnetic North. So that, you know, pilots had to uh, were getting problems where you know their GPSs were off by. <laughs> something like 40 miles, and they, were, they weren't finding the airports. This happened not too long ago. And they have to keep recalibrating with the, the GPS because it's like, yeah, you know, here you are going to land, especially if you're going into, say, like San Francisco Airport. I remember uh, 92 when I flew to San Francisco, and then I took a bus to Los Angeles and then hitchhiked a bit, whatever. And uh, it was like it was like $700 to fly from Ottawa to Los Angeles, uh, but it was only 550 to fly to San Francisco, and the the bus ride was something like 60 bucks, or something like that to from San Francisco. I was like, okay, well, <laughs> you know, 600 I saved 100 bucks, right? And, and I got to see the scenic route on on top of that, and drive by all those miles and miles and miles of windmills, half of them not moving, <laughs> you know, because there wasn't enough wind. Um, yeah, yeah, watch our carbon footprint, but let's just you know pollute the land. With, you know. Uh, but anyway, I digress. So anyway, yeah, so the pole shift, if the poles are, the magnetic poles are shifting, the weather's going to, you know, do strange things. And I, there's a problem with the Earth's core that scientists are trying to figure out what's going on. And they can't quite figure it out. And you, uh, all these big booms you're hearing around the world, uh, you know, like uh, some areas is worse than others, and they don't know what it is, uh, but they think it's something from within the Earth, that type of thing. So there's a lot of things that we just can't account for. It's just kind of, we just don't know. You know, we, we just don't know. Is there a giant iron ball in the center of the Earth? We really don't know. Uh, they've recently discovered, like, you know, like 1,800 miles into the Earth, fresh water. Where did that come from? You know what I mean? Like that type of thing. Uh, it, it's, it, there's just so much that we don't know. But what we do know is that we can look at the climate change models and stuff like that. Look at the solutions they're offering. It's just taxation. Uh, there, this is going to be you know tax and spend, tax and spend, tax and spend. And when you keep catching the climate, uh, pro climate change uh, scientists manipulating the data, again you got to look how the data is you know collected and stuff like that. It gets refuted pretty quickly. And again, just look at when you have, if you're just trusting the science. Um, Again, 740, uh, 749 UN-backed, you know, <laughs> Rothschild-backed, kind of Rockefeller-backed uh, climate scientists, and they, they are because, I mean, these are the institutions that put that out, versus 20-some-odd thousand scientists that have looked at it and said, no, the, the, no respectable scientists can actually accept these things. You have to look at that. The problem is, is the media, at the end of the day, is owned by the Rothschilds. You have to understand the weather is traded on the stock market. That, that's another one. So manipulation of weather and stuff like that, I do believe the science is there, but I don't think it's an exact science yet, like CARP and stuff like that. I do believe they, they can do some damage that way with, and with the, the chemtrail spraying and stuff like that, which is becoming op more openly admitted at time. Uh, you know, even the United Nations has a ban on uh, geoengineering, but yet, <laughs> you know... <laughs> You know, it, you know, everybody denies it exists, but they got a ban on it. Well, why do they got a ban on it? Because the science does work to, you know, they're, they're try it looks like they're trying to create the, the climate change effect that they want. But I don't think it's working. I think it has adverse effects. Um, that type of thing. So the aerosol spring is our global warming, you know, that type of thing. Now, why are they doing it exactly? Now, some people say, well, because that's what's keeping the ice age from happening. I think if Mother Nature decides to have an ice age, we have an ice age, you know. 
that, that, that type of thing. If she decides to turn us into a molten ball of lava, that's what's going to happen. Uh, the volcanic activity is something to keep an eye on because I, I think that has a lot, to, you know, that, that I think is our canary in the coal mine uh, from what the scientists have said. That, again, you look around the world, volcano, volcanoes seem to trigger these big uh, cooling events. They, they tend to be not always responsible, but they tend to have, there tends to be a, a link there. So I think maybe the volcanoes is something to really watch. Uh, volcanoes, uh, you know, I forget it. There's always, yeah, I forget what the number, like between 45 and 50 active every year, something like that. Uh, but I think it's up a little. You know, it's up higher than normal. The other ones is the fact that the land masses are changing. A butterfly effect, the land mass just changes a little bit one area. That could change, you know, butterfly effect, change the way the winds go. Who knows? And then that, that, that butterfly effect and that butterfly effect. But the jet streams... Uh, for example, if the jet streams right now are they're kind of flattening out, they're not going as low, that tells you that you're probably going to have a very dry center of planet, like very dry and arid. And you see it in the California and stuff like that, how dry and arid it is. It is That could have something to do with the drought there. But that also means it'll trap the cold air up here, which is not good for us, um, that type of thing. So it's only only after we can only examine the aftermath then because we really can't predict the future there's just too many variables but what we can say is that okay look the data is flawed uh, the feedback loop uh, they finally figured out how they're wrong and how they calculated it the feedback loop doesn't work with what actually happens and that's what you have to look at so the other thing too is if you're you know you have to take your information from both sides of the argument and I do, and I do. Like for example, if you listen to DW News, uh, they're all, they're pro climate change. You know, they they think everything is anthropogenic, man-made global warming, uh, but it's not. You know, uh, I, I disagree with that. The science tells me completely different. Uh, and they're always trying to spin it that well. What's happening is the reason why we're getting so much cooling is because of all the warming. Now the way they explain it, it does make sense. But we got cooling. Not warming. <laughs> you know what I mean? So then it's no longer warming. We're, we're, no, you know, we're, no, we're no longer in the warming trend or whatever. Right now, I think we're, you know, it, it'll peter out. Like, it, you're going to have up years, you're going to have down years. And ex the other thing, too, is whenever they come out and said, uh, 2014, the hottest year on record. But then it was selective where they picked the, uh, the you know, they took the hottest areas. And, you know, it was really, it's manipulated. You know, and they do this year after year. So the, 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 the scary part is we actually don't really know the truth of what's actually happening. But I think there's other people out there that you know, can kind of keep an eye on like the thermals of the planet and you know, just get the average temperature around the world and you can get an idea day and night and then you can get an idea of whether we're actually warming or cooling. Because there's some spots that have hit such record cold in the last past two years. It's, it's you know, it's... it's you know, that doesn't make the news because it goes against the narrative. And this is why the news, is, you know, especially like the CBC here in Canada, defund them again. When they're, when they're pushing narrative, uh, it's supposed to be non-biased, objective journalism that they're doing, and they're not. It's just narrative. Um, people don't want that anymore. Uh, you, you know, and again, a news that lies to you all the time, you know, and then they're, you know, trying to butter up this, this just for taxation. And then all these politicians, again, same thing, you know, uh, and the, the argument, that the, the, the drawback is the argument always comes, well, it's just because these people are for the oil companies. No. Uh, these scientists, most of these scientists, some of them did work for the oil companies, sure. Uh, but a lot of them don't. A lot of them don't. Uh, so that type of thing. Now, what about pollution? Okay, this is where I've got to explain myself, I think, a little more. Is, for example, um, you know, environmental laws that protect the environment, I'm okay for. Clean rivers, for example, banning a two-stroke engines. Uh, type of stuff like that, or not really banning them, but just no longer producing two-stroke engines uh, in a lot of areas, I think is a step in the right direction. Your two-stroke lawnmower uh, is like running, you know, every time you cut your grass, it, it puts out the emissions of something, running a, like a, a Chevy full-size van, cargo van, uh, for like a month or something like that. Like, it puts out a lot. So, okay, yeah. Yeah, we can reduce that. The other thing is the stuff in the water, uh, uh, again, uh, Alex Jones did the, uh, uh, they're turning the frogs gay type of thing with all the stuff in the water. Yeah, stuff like that. The water is so precious. 
uh, benzene, stuff like that in the environment, uh, ben, you know, like uh, leaded gas. Back in the 90s, there was a huge violence, uh, you know, big plague of violence in, in uh, Miami, Florida. And they think it had something to do with all the, the you know, from the uh, lead in the uh, gasoline and stuff like that. And when they started removing that, they started noticing a trend that it was becoming less violent. Now, is that exact science? I don't know. But that does, you know, like there's unintended con- consequences of everything. Windmills, supposed to be really great. <laughs> Birds fly into them. Uh, it, it, they're very harmful to bird migrations. I mean, you got these towers that are 80, 100 feet tall, 120 feet tall, and I can't catch up on those, but you could jump on the chair and interrupt the video. Hey, you could do that, eh? Pull your tail off. Or pull your tail. Cut your tail. Work for my affection. Work for it. Anyway. Uh, but anyway, um, yeah, so pollution is something that, yeah, we can, do, we can do a better job. But what pisses me off, my dad says it too, he goes, it really pisses me off. Here they are, you know, recycle your cans, recycle this, and then, you know, you got the, you know, Exxon Mobil. You know, you know, big Exxon, uh, not Exxon Mobil, sorry. Exxon Valdez, sorry. You know, all, the, all these, yeah, just, just block the camera, that's okay. I wasn't making a video or nothing. Yeah. Say hi to the camera. Oh, gonna blow. It's a cataclypse. There we go. Yeah. So you got, like, basically, uh, you know, just re- regular pollution. Pollution of the oceans. Uh, the, eh, the use of, overuse of plastics. Now, plastics are petroleum products. And this is something that a lot of people, when they say, oh, we've got to stop using oil, we've got to stop. They don't understand almost everything has oil in it. This remote is made with petroleum products, you know. Um, people need to go back, and I, and I find it funny now, you're seeing the paper bag resurgence. Back in the 80s, okay, everything was paper bags. Plastic bags, yeah, there were some, I'm sure there's always been plastic bags. But everybody made plastic bags. And the big thing was, oh, we're killing so many trees, we've got to stop the plastic bags. We've got to go to plastic bags. Now plastic bags, they're in landfills for, you know, and you're using more petroleum to make these, these, these plastic bags, right? So well, let's try to recycle the bags, but there's too many of them. Can't recycle them. Pop bottles, same thing. Uh, pop bottle recycling, I think they got down pretty good. And it's amazing, like, a lot of the clothes you wear is made out of pop bottles. That's why your jackets, like, last, like, a season. Because <laughs> it, it's, the fibers are, are pop bottles. It's very, very fascinating. But I'm, I, I like the ingenuity of it. And to me, if I was prime minister of this country, and again, you'd need a nationalist government to really think this way. Nationalist uh, governments do tend to really want to protect the environment. Uh, that type of thing. And one thing I would have is gigantic, rather than make work projects, gigantic recycling projects. And to recycle just about everything. Tires. You could turn tires into fuel. Uh, You could basically turn them into gasoline. There's a process. Breaking down these plastics. But moving away from plastics. And and we could do it. So we went from paper bags. Uh, We're cutting down too many trees and making too much, uh, you know, with the pulp and everything like that. So cardboard and paper bags. Okay, well, let's... Well, let's move the plastic that way. You know, plastic's completely recyclable and renewable. But it, it wasn't the solution they wanted. And, you know, every landfill is just a, just a nightmare. So then they're talking about going back to plastic bags again. But the bags that I like is those reusable ones. And my dad, like, he's got like, a stack of bags that he goes and does groceries. We bring our own bags with us. So I'm all for them charging you a fee for the bags, you know, the extra 10 cents or whatever. I'm all for that because it does give incentives uh, let's say you buy the, that reusable bag, okay, well, most people, what they do is they just leave them in their car, so if they go shopping, they bring the bags in with them, throw them in the shopping cart, they buy everything, they, they got their own bags, that has probably kept more stuff out of the landfill and saved more trees, and it was a simple solution, just reusable bags, you know, that, you know these, these kind of, and a lot of those are probably made out of recycled pop bottles, <laughs> you know what I mean? So, that, like, yeah, I'm all for stuff like that. Um, fossil fuels, uh, the thing about the fossil fuels is there's a bit of a, a debate about that. And I, my, the jury's still out on it. Like, for me, I, I, I don't just ju- jump into one camp or another. The climate change thing, I probably looked at it for two years before I, I said, okay, well, you know, both sides are making good arguments, but then, you know, the side that's arguing against it is, seems to be saying, no, what, what's going on with the planet is, is probably more cyclic and stuff like that, and all this fear-mongering of, of, of the uh, global warming is really just playing into the politicians. Oh, oh, well, you can't live, we need to bring in this, uh, this rule and that rule and this fine and this tax and whatever. And it doesn't really save the environment, it just it, it gives just more authority over people to, uh, you know, basically lock down your society. 
smart meters, all these things. Uh, I'm not against the technology, but uh, I'm against how it's used, right? Or I'm either for how it's used or against how it's used. And when I see, you know, heavy environmental regulations come into Canada and puts manufacturing out of business here uh, and stuff like that, and then we send all our jobs to Mexico, China, or India, which pretty much have zero environmental regulations. Now, China is, is I mean, these people, some of these cities, they have to walk around with masks on because... Uh, the air burns your face. Like, I mean, you know, the hypocrisy here is we're just displacing the problem. That's not real environmentalism. Oh, but they're developing nations. They've been developing for long enough. They could have, you know, NAFTA has been around. Okay, you're telling me since NAFTA, since the 19, uh, 1990s, 91 to 2017, okay, they've had 36 years. 36 years years, okay, 1991, uh, sorry, I got, my, I got my math right here, but anyway, <laughs> 26 years or 36 years, okay, 1991 to 2001, there's 10 years, okay, 10 years for a developing country, not enough, uh, yeah, uh, two, yeah, sorry, 26 years, uh, 2001 to 2011, you've got 20 years, you're telling me in 20 years you can't figure out how to put a scrubber in a, in a coal plant? <laughs> you know what I mean? While you're mass producing the world's junk, you're telling me you can't figure out how to recycle or you know clean up your act. Add another uh, six years on that. Uh, yeah, like so, it, it, it's there's no excuse. But look who's making money off of it, right? So that, that type of thing. So if we were really conscientious about the, uh, and this is something that Donald Trump might actually be doing. Uh, I don't know where Donald Trump really stands on the uh, environment. He seems to be lukewarm on it, which is good. Which is good. It means he's not going to be, you know, all oil company, uh, all you know, all the way. Uh, and it, but it also doesn't mean he's going to be, uh, you know, don't step on a blade of grass. And there's, it seems like you got radicals in each camp. Fracking, I still don't know about. What it looks like, I don't think fracking. I think fracking does create a lot of problems. But on the other hand, we, there's. All this talk, again, since the 90s with this carbon, uh, carbon taxes and cap and trade, yeah, the politicians make money off of this like you wouldn't believe. And if we've been doing it since that time, okay, in that time, you're telling me in that time we haven't found a way to reduce our oil consumption. We haven't found a way. Of course we haven't found a way because they're not even trying. All these people pushing this climate change and environmentalism and stuff like that. No, they're about getting funding for their research or whatever. Okay, fine, research. But once you find the problem, then you turn your money into public works projects to get rid of the problem. And if the problem is too much oil consumption, then we need to start getting 100 mile per gallon cars. We need to find materials, use, uh, find ways of, I mean, glass works better than plastic. Uh, glass is 100% recyclable too, uh, that type of thing. So, you know, go back to more glass jars, uh, cans, uh, cans versus plastic bottles. Cans have their problem, yeah, sure, but you can recycle cans, you know, until they get too rusty. You can recycle the, 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 the metal, that type of thing. Um, for example, the, the uh, burlap and hemp and stuff like that went out. Like, stuff like that. I am all for using... I hate the smell of hemp, but... I'm all for using those kind of... You want out, too? All right, out you go. Both you. Get the hell out. Move it. Not heating the outdoors. Uh, bo both have their merits. Uh, both have their drawbacks. Uh, biofuels. Okay. Do you guys remember the big ethanol thing? That, that was going to be the... You know, the, the answer was ethanol. Well, I think ethanol on a small scale works quite well, but... Uh, a lot of times, you know, like, and it, this is also a pro problem with our food production is we're making ethanol instead of, uh, you know, like the, the concept of ethanol is excellent because uh, it burns cleaner. It, it's whatever. You get it from corn. You can get it from potatoes. You can get it from pretty much anything. Basically, ethanol is non-drinkable moonshine. <laughs> That's pretty much the simplest way to put it. Uh, could, you know, taking the corn... Growing the corn, so you need all that agriculture to grow massive, using massive amount of land to grow this, the, this, these corn crops. Then you take that corn, and you got to use a big harvester to get it. And then you got to take it, put it into, uh, take it to market. Then you got to sell for market, put it in more trucks, 
to get it to a refinery, then you got a refinery, then you got to send in more trucks to get it out of there. So there, it, it's, it, I think it turned out like three or four times more expensive to make it. But it was more, it's cleaner. The other thing is, for example, uh, my friend Bob, you know my sh the old guy there that I always go shooting with and we wear hearing protection on the gun range, not so much to protect our hearing, but to keep the bullshit out, that guy. <laughs> I can have to call him, see how he's doing. Uh, we haven't been shooting for a while there. We won't be opening range until spring. But um, the, the thing is, is he just bought a little car. I forget what car it is. I think it's a Hyundai. And it's either a Mitsubishi or a Hyundai, whatever. It gets 54 to 57 miles to the gallon. He says, it was rated at 54 miles to the gallon, but some days he gets 57. I'm like, wow. Like, even in motorcycle terms, that's pretty good. Most motorbikes don't get 60 miles to the gallon. A lot of them do. I, I had uh, my BMW R60. It got 60 miles to the gallon. Uh, my LTD 440, I swear that thing, maybe I had a, a unique one. It got 75 miles to the gallon. That's about 120 kilometers to the, to the gallon. Uh, that it was, you'd ride them around. Now, this new bike I got, I don't know what it gets, but it probably gets better than the average family car. My little van, I eco-drive it as much as possible. I drive it, you know, 70, 80, 90 kilometers an hour. In the wintertime, I tend to drive it, you know, usually tr don't normally go above 80. Uh, you know, sometimes it's 60, depending on what the roads are like. Uh, but I eco-drive it, and that's, that's things probably getting close to 40 miles to the gallon, definitely well over 30, maybe 35. Uh, you know, uh, that type of thing. But it's old technology. Now, as old technology phases out, it's the new technology that becomes more... Uh, for example, the Samsung phone that I use. Every aspect of this phone is 100% recyclable. So that's good. So recycling might be... I think the stopgap, but I think the other thing is the return to qual quality. We, don't, we make everything out of cheap stuff. You know, uh, I got a drill. It was probably made in 1932. This thing, you can use it as a drill. You watch the lights, like this thing uses so much power. There's like sparks coming out of the armature and stuff like that on the sides of it when you use it. Uh, it torques your wrist. Like if you're not hanging on, this thing's going to say, there's a little tiny drill, like the metal drill. I still have it. It's like, Whoo! Things like just a complete, from the 1930s, that, that, that's, they don't build them like they used to. Okay. The other thing about it is, is, is it probably uses like 25 amps just to press the trigger. So it's not very efficient, but it's reliable as hell. And the other thing about it is, is that it never wears out. So the problem with the consumer-based economy is you're always trying to build something just good enough that it works long enough so that when it breaks, you go buy, you throw it away and you buy another one. And this is one of the things, and this used to stress out some of the people I work with. I uh, worked in a retail store, you know, tool store. And we had a really good return policy there. Basically, because we got the stuff from China, a lot of stuff from India, it was built cheaper stuff from the lowest bidder for everyday low prices, right? And we'd sell, I'd say, 10 uh, cordless drills or drills, whatever. And out of those 10, drill, uh, 10 drills, about two of them are going to come back as defected. And that was factored into the price that there's probably, because it's, you know, so cheap, whatever. Those drills, we take them, smash them up, throw them in the, in, in the uh, steel bin. And the, the problem with that is, like, okay, it would go to, like, say, Baker Brothers or whoever would pick up the steel from us and whatever. So we'd pay to haul this stuff away. And they would recycle some of it. But not all of it was recyclable. And that's where I hold China, India, Mexico, and other countries like it accountable is that, okay, you can build this crap, but you're going to have to start taking some of this crap back if, if it's no good. Up the quality. Now, what you see, and you see with the Japanese, they tend to do this. And even the Chinese have done this to a great degree. Like the first batch of drills you get, like one in every 10 comes back. Then by the time you're on your 10th batch of drills coming in over the years, it's like maybe one in every 100 fails, which is, you know, it's better. But you still got a landfill full of stuff that can be thrown through a recycling plant. To, to me, rather than having people on welfare, you build recycling plants in your cities. Get the people on welfare. We, we need people there all the time. Now, once the plant's full, okay, you can't do that. But open those jobs specifically for those people so whenever somebody moves on to a better job, you, you know, you're always taking somebody with no job experience, you get them on the job training, you're helping the environment. Yes, there will be a bit of a cost, but it's like anything, it, it keeps velocity of money in your country. Uh, it becomes a part of the government. Rather than having people sitting in office, office buildings, have them recycling, have them doing this, have them planting trees, have them reclaiming, reclaiming lands. Old abandoned buildings and stuff like that. I mean, I don't know why we don't have a whole bunch of make-work projects, uh, public work. I, I'm more of a fan of public works. 
like anything, you have to keep within a fiscally balanced budget. But I'm more of a fan of public works out there cleaning up the environment than I am for them, you know, for, you know, paper pushers. Again, we can have environmental laws that would, you know, recycling, I think, would be the stopgap. How do we get off of fossil fuels? Well, it's easy. We stop using fossil fuels. <laughs> uh, what does that mean? Well, we're going to go back to whaling, uh, getting whale oil again. We're going to go back to uh, coal, coal mines. Uh, in Canada, I think there's like two coal plants left or something like that. I'm not against coal per se, but because it is cheap, it's, an, it's a cheaper energy. But we don't have, it, it's, we can burn the coal fairly uh, cleanly, but the problem is, is it's not clean enough. There's got to be better. Uh, biofuels, some, like for example, um, biodiesel. A lot of it is, you can make it, but the problem they have is the smog that comes from the biodiesel. That's where the problem lies. So we're still using petroleum-based diesel, uh, that type of thing. So it, there, the technology, I think, can get there, but we have to invest in that. So rather than hiring all these climate scientists and all that stuff and you know, being with the UN and all that, no, get, get out of that stuff and just take care of the environment. Building vehicles that get better mileage. Uh, hydrogen, um, I'm going to be doing a separate video on this, and I've got to wrap this up because I'm running out of time. Again, huge subject, so hopefully I've explained myself fairly well. But uh, hydrogen-backed vehicles, I've run engines off of hydrogen before, little gas-powered engines. Hey, you know, it, you can do it. Every modern vehicle should have an attachment, like you would attach an NOS bottle, but instead hydrogen. Let it roll out at like 1.5 to 3 C CFM. Instead of getting 60 miles a gallon, maybe that little car would get 120 miles to the gallon. Might be bad for the oil companies, but I think we need to basically take our resources and, and uh, nationalize all our resources because the private companies, they haven't, they, they, no, it's not working. So, yes, I do believe in environmentalism to take care of the environment to lower the carbon footprint. Uh, not, I mean, again, one last little thing here with the carbon footprint. How are we going to lower our carbon footprint when we're bringing in a quarter million people per year now, almost a half million people per year? You know what I mean? It doesn't make sense. So these people that are calling for all this stuff, they, they, they usually... They're such hypocrites. But anyway, I'll leave it at that. So next time, if you like this kind of content, please consider making a donation channel. Links down below. Thank you so much to everybody else. Next time, rate, subscribe, share, comment, like, be true to yourself, be true to others. Always, always do the right thing. And have a great day. <coughs> G'day. Hi, and welcome. Got myself off guard there. All right. Okay. I got some explaining to do. Check out my hat. Um, the climate change thing. I, I've done videos on it before and stuff like that. I got to explain my position. I, I, think, I think it's only fair that I do that. And... I know some people, when you, you come out and you say you don't believe in uh, global warming, uh, they take it as a personal attack sometimes, but uh, that type of thing. And I find millennials have more, been more duped into it or whatever. Now, when I say I don't believe in global warming or whatever, it's kind of like how, you know, Russians hacked everything. <laughs> I kind of take it like that. Is there been global warming? Yes. There's clear, what I'm saying is I don't believe in anthropogenic man-made global warming. I, you know, it's not due to the CO2 levels. I let, let me explain here. When I first heard the term global warming, oh my God, the, the sky has fallen, the earth is going to, we're all going to be living on the surface of Mars by 2013. This is back in the 90s. The Al Gore hockey stick. Oh my God, we're all going to die. And back, in, back when it came out, the internet wasn't as prevalent, uh, prevalent as it is now for finding information and stuff. Like, you, you, the internet was there, but... It was not, not the, the treasure trove of information. Come on up. Come on, Missy. You're going to interrupt the video anyway, so you must come up. Tell her to come up. She'll come up. If I don't say nothing, she'll just do it. Uh, the thing is, is that, you know, I was, I, like everybody, you're concerned about it. You're like, oh, my God, that, that's, uh, that's terrible. That's kill. We kill off. And uh, she, she has to come and, you know, ruin the video. Always. And uh, anyway, uh, yeah, it's like you, you're, you don't, you, you're concerned. You're definitely concerned. So you look at it and then you hear, you know, just one thing after that. Oh, my God, you know, if you don't do this or you don't do that, comply, comply, comply. And, oh, we have to bring in this new law and this new tax and this new everything uh, to, you know, or else the, the world's going to explode, you know. So then... After a while, you start to get a, a difference of opinion, and it's like, okay, well, those people, why are they saying what they're saying? And for me, uh, at first, it was the, the argument, you know, what they were saying, well, no, that's just the oil company scientists, uh, you know, doing what they do. So that became a good scapegoat for a while, and people still believed on it, 
you know. But then what you had was 749, I think, scientists, 48, 49 uh, scientists out of, I think, 1,100 polled globally. And out of that, the, the high majority of them, was, uh, something like 748, 749, said yes. Global warming, there's global warming and there's a problem and stuff like that. Uh, now, again, you have to think of one little detail here. Yes, of course we've been warming since the last ice age. You know, so that, that's a given. But the thing is, is rapid global warming that we were going to hit like 2 degrees centigrade and it would be complete biomass failure and stuff like that. Um, and, and, and that big scare. Uh, you know, the, the, the thing is, is that you have these scientists that said that. Then there was like, you know, a few thousand scientists saying, no, there, this is not man-made. This is, uh, CO2 doesn't drive climate. Climate drives CO2. It's the other way around. And the feedback loop that they were using, Lord Monkston, uh, he's, he's, he's kind of dry to listen to, but uh, he's done a lot of research on this. And it was, oh, he's in bed with the oil companies, whatever. Uh, not so much so. Now, then at a while, after a while, it started to get, and I, and I wasn't really looking at the, like, it wasn't my number one issue. It was never my number one issue. And then it got to 11,000 11, scientists were saying, no, <laughs> this is, this is pho phony and false. This is a fake narrative. Now it's over 20,000 scientists out there. Trust me, they don't all work for an oil company. Is there doctoring on both sides? Yes, there is oil company scientists out there that um, are saying no. Uh, but there's other scientists that are nonpartisan that are saying no. And again, that number of scientists, you know, they're not accepting the theory that like, it, 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 doesn't, hold, it doesn't hold water. So what was supposed to happen? The greenhouse effect, I've seen the scientific experiments, and it's like, okay, well, the, the theory works. It, it does work. It, you know, you put, it, but the thing is, is their theories aren't happening. You know, where they say the CO2 is supposed to build up in, in the atmosphere, it's not. It's not going that high. And the other thing, too, is it's, no, it's not even one thousandth of a lethal dose of uh, the CO2. And, you know, it goes on and on and on and on and on. And then, uh, you know, uh, Colbert Report did a, a, a really good, good thing on it. This is a huge subject anyway. Uh, but, you know, the short of it is, is that the, the CO2 isn't building up to the levels. And, in fact, in a lot of areas, trees are just starving for extra CO2. We actually could use more of it. Now, what I say is I separate pollution from climate change because one doesn't necessarily drive the other. Uh, I'm not saying... Humans have no impact on the environment whatsoever. I'm saying man is no match for Mother Nature is what I'm saying. And the thing is, is the other thing you have to look at is where the sensors are. The majority of them are all in the states, which the states, most of the states is pretty warm to begin with. I mean, it's more southern than up here in Canada. If, every, if the amount of uh, thermometers in the states were up here in Canada, you would see, the, you would see cooler temperatures because we have longer winters and stuff like that. Uh, and in the pole regions, there's something like, I think, eight sensors in the... Uh, uh, Antarctic and 16 in the North Pole or something, I don't know, the other way around. It's been a while since I looked at it. And there's like 7,000 pretty much like throughout the states. And they're all near the big cities and stuff like that. So where they set the thermometers, and they're not equally distributed around the world. And you know, there's a, I can't remember, 16, 1700 throughout Europe and stuff like that. So it's not a, a perfect representation of temperature. And the other problem too is the times of day they take the temperature, and there's, there, there lies a problem. It's not a 24-hour temperature reading, uh, you know, for an average temperature. It's done during the day. It's warmer during the day. Any place on the planet is usually warmer during the day, uh, except for maybe in the Arctic Poles where you have six, six months a day, six months of, of, of night. So these things have to be taken con into consideration. And, of course, NOAA, which is at the end of the day owned by the Rothschilds, and they keep getting caught manipulating the data to show more warming than there is. And how much warming are we talking about? Well, 0.85 of a degree. Like, it's, it's not even one degree that the, 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 the temperature is up. And nobody ever talks about the benefits of an actual longer growing season and stuff like that from warmer climates. And it goes on and on and on and on and on. And you even have the guy who came up with Al Gore with the hockey stick curve uh, for global warming, is he uh, this guy, the UN guy? Uh, I can't remember his name, but he's like the scientist that pretty much kicked this all off. 
even he's come out and said there's been no significant global warming in 19 to 20 years. It, it's you know it, it's like this. It's not it's not the hockey stick curve. Now, were there times where 